I'm about to show you the greatest tennis video ever made. It's the perfect recap of the US Open. It's from my buddy, Matt Bradshaw of Coffee Break Tennis. He's gonna be singing a song dedicated to Dominic Thiem winning this first Grand Slam title. What you need to do is you need to smash up this video and go to Coffee Break Tennis and definitely smash his subscribe button like 50 times in a row to show him how amazing this video is. This is awesome. He's part of TennisCon 4. Go down the description. Make sure you get on the early bird alert list. He's going to be doing um, a topic on big numbers, the big numbers that you need to know to win more matches. Oh, my gosh. You're going to watch this video 50 times in a row. This is way better than anything on the tennis channels ever done. Enjoy. I want more You're more than superstar Like superstar Alles Kinder ist da zu mir Winning slams is lots of fun Ich war da alle gewinnen Som I want some I want shoes Not the kind that make you slip on the hard court I mean who Make a new shoe who make you slip on a hard court All I know is next is clay My moment, my stunde, my woche, my day Bravo, look out, I'm here to play I want some, want some I want more slams now, baby Right now, like more the superstar Right now, right now Auf Sand und auf Hart, baby Auf Hart, wir spielen jetzt now Diese Jahre jetzt now Dominic Team is a Grand Slam champion today on Coffee Break Tennis. That is the main topic of discussion, how the match was won, why some people think it was an ugly match, not a worthy, uh, not worthy of a final type match. We got a great piece on today's show from Geary Nathan over at Defector.com. I haven't heard of uh, this website before, but I've heard of Geary Nathan, and he does a good job characterizing what really went down in that final match. We'll talk about that. Uh, plus, an exclusive interview with Dominic Team on the phone live later in the show. We'll get to that. And, uh, and also, we have the, uh, some clips from the press conference right after Dominic Team won his major. I think he did a great job responding to some of the big questions about the match. Uh, he did a great job in that presser making a lot of things clear. You got to appreciate the honesty from Dominic Team, and we sure will do that on today's edition of Coffee Break Tennis. Welcome to Coffee Break Tennis. The fastest growing, most talked about, most listened to, most watched tennis talk show in the world. I'm your host, Matt Bradshaw. And I sure am happy that you're here today. So let's go right into uh, this tweet. Because I thought this uh, this did a good job capturing the feeling of a lot of people. Not, not the feeling that, oh, this match was terrible. Some people said that. I think those are most likely tennis fans who haven't been watching as long or just simply... Uh, spoiled by the incredible tennis we always expect from the big three and the people that try to go up and throw everything they have in a challenge against the big three. This tweet from Andy Finlayson, I don't know if that's how he says his name, but this is a tweet. I thought it did a good job capturing a, a reasonable response from many tennis fans. He does deserve it, Dominic Team, meaning, but kind of wish he'd won his maiden slam the way the others had won it. Murray, Stan, Chilich, yes, even Chilich had Roger Federer in the semifinals, but still. And Del Potro all had to go through the big dogs to win their first slam. Obviously, it's through no fault of his own, just insane circumstances. And I think a lot of people are feeling this way. And, you know, Dominic Team, that's why I said on the, uh, the Patron Saint podcast the other day, I said there's always going to be a little bit of an asterisk here, but there's one way to break out of it. And I'm not saying there should be an asterisk. I'm saying the fact that Djokovic got defaulted, you're always going to have a percentage of Djokovic fans who are going to say it's BS. The whole thing's BS. Djokovic would have won. He shouldn't have been defaulted. You'll have a percentage of fans who say they did the right thing. He should have been defaulted. But had he not, had he hit that ball just a little different and it went two inches to the right and not hit that lady at all, 
he would have went on to win the slam, and it's just an unfortunate accident. Lots of people are always going to look at it that way. It's not Dominic Team's fault, though. You know, we've seen uh, one of the easiest examples to point to is 2017 U.S. Open when Rafa Nadal wins it. Uh, I, I still can't remember the stat, but it's something like he doesn't face anyone inside the top 50 for most of the tournament. And then uh, I think Kevin Anderson re- was the only guy he played, maybe one other inside of the top 30 for the for the entire tournament. So stuff like this happens. It's not the fault of the player. A grand slam is you play seven matches, best out of five. That's why it's such an amazing accomplishment because it's seven matches in two weeks, best out of five sets. And you play whoever happens to be there. It's not Dominic Team's fault. There will always be a little bit of an asterisk, depending on how things go forwards for Dominic Team. If he steps up and he wins the French Open somehow, the asterisk is gone, especially if he does do what Andy Finlayson was talking about here, if Dami is able to take out a Rafa or a Djokovic. I mean, he beat Djokovic on clay at the French Open last year. Is that not enough for you people? He beat Rafa at the Australian Open. I guess uh, beating Djokovic at his favorite Australian Open is a bigger deal. Beating Rafa at his favorite the French Open is a big deal. But Dominic Team said something very important in his press conference, and we'll take a look at it in a second. He said, it was all nerves. A lot of people were speculating that he had an issue with his heel or his ankle or something, and that's, what it, that's not what it was. It was all nerves. It was just like we had said on this show, the preview to the final. This is a rare moment. In a history, uh, the recent history of tennis since 2003 almost, pretty much, we've seen the big three either having epic battles with each other where they always say, just like Roger said last year at Wimbledon in the presser, Roger said something like, "Um, I've played Rafa a million times, so preparing for him is, you know, it's no different than before. We know the patterns of play, we know to expect, and we know that we're going to have to play, I'm going to have to play close to my best if I want to win. Same with the final with Djokovic. Those guys... They know what's expected of them, and a little bit of pressure is gone because they go out there and they know they have to play their best, and they go for it. This was totally different with Dominic Team and Sasha Zverev for both of them. This was, uh, you know, the biggest opportunity of their lives, and no big three, one win away from someone who's beatable, right? Zverev would rather play Team in the final than Roger Rafa Novak, and Team would rather play Zverev in the final as opposed to Roger Rafa or Novak. I really hope Dominic Team somehow wins the French Open because, one, as a Federer fan, no one will tie the Federer record, and then it will really be called into doubt whether anyone's going to uh, win if Dominic Team starts taking over everything. I don't know if he will. It's a big transition. But, uh, you know, let's get into uh, let's get into the stuff from the presser because they had uh, a lot. And then we'll look at the Gary Nathan piece, and then we'll take a call from Dominic Team, and we'll get out of here. Let's take a listen to this uh, first thing I picked out for you from the press inter- uh, press conference after the win for Dominic Team, And he's talking about what was going on with the nerves and why uh, he was playing, why he had a rough start, why he went down, why he went down two sets to love. Take a listen. For him, it was his first major finals, and... Uh for him was was the same like for me um we both didn't face one of the big three so i guess that was in the back of the head for both of us and that's why we were on nerves because it was was a very good chance for for the both of us so i think it's obvious that i was very tight in the beginning and uh in the end of course we we are both experienced enough and we both know that in a fifth set tiebreak, uh, anybody can can win. So, <laughs> I think it's it's very understandable that we both uh, didn't play our highest pace anymore. <laughs> it was not a match where they were playing their very best at the same time quite frequently, but there were there was you know moments of of great tennis, stretches of great tennis for Zverev. Uh, in the fourth set, Dominic Team was playing a, a pretty high level most of the time, and Zverev was starting to fall down. But take a listen to this. This does an even better job. This is towards the end of the presser when they ask about, they ask specifically in the first two sets, Dominic, was your ankle bothering you? Was your heel bothering you? You may not be 100% uh, coming into the match. Uh, How were you physically at the beginning of the match and and how did it evolve? Physically, I was 100% fine in the beginning of the match. Um, I had some troubles with the Achilles in the semis, but that worked out great. I didn't feel any pain, but the problem was my nerves. I was super, super tight, tighter than in a long time. So didn't even know how that feels anymore. Didn't even know how 
to get rid of that, but somehow I did it in, in the third set. And as I said, the, the emotions, they were much, much tougher to handle today than, than, the, than my body because it, w- it was fine. This, to me, the, the best answer of the whole press conference, one of the most honest uh, answers we've heard in a while, the fact that he said, I was super tight, super tight, tighter than in a long time. I didn't even know how that feels anymore. That's crazy to think about. But, you know, he's obviously, he's played big pressure matches. But like I was saying, going up against Djokovic in the final, that's a lot different than being in the final against the guy that you should beat, that you can beat, that you see a, a path forwards to beat. I didn't even know how to get rid of those kind of feelings anymore. The emotions were much, much tougher to handle than my body because it was fine. There was another question that got a little bit into that, too. A week from now, you're going to be going back to Roland Garros as the two-time defending runner-up, both times to Rafa. How difficult a transition will that be for you? And does Rafa have a decided advantage because he opted not to come to the United States? Physically, I'm going to be fine, 100%. Uh, going to have enough time to recover from, from all the troubles I had. But the question is how I'm going to do it with, with the emotions mentally because obviously I've never been in the situation. I achieved a big, big goal. So, well, I don't know how I'm going to feel the next days. But at the same time, uh, it's going to be, or I expect that it's going to be uh, easier for me now in the biggest tournaments because of of course I had it in the back of my head that I mean I, I had a great career so far way better career than I could ever dreamt of but until today there was still a big part a big goal missing that, okay that that I take it back that is the most honest answer of all because Dominic team basically just told us that his his greatest fear buried down deep inside that came up in this match and made him play so super, super tight, as he was saying, is it entered his mind that he might never win. And I love how polite and what a nice guy Dominic Team is because he has to kind of put that up front. I've had a great career. I'm not trying to say I'm ungrateful by any means, but he's very aware that there was a chance he never wins one of these, you know, for for whatever reason. And, and it was going to be hard for him to say to himself, you know, how am I going to win one of these? To ask himself that question if he had gone down and lost to Sasha, as he likes to say. If Sasha had beat him, and obviously he was thinking about it in the match. I'm blowing this. I'm down two sets to love. Uh, he also went on to say that he knew, because they asked him, was there a moment you stopped believing you would win? Take a listen for yourself. Uh, it's a slam finals. And I said myself, <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm playing bad. I'm way too tight. Uh, legs are heavy. Arms are ev- heavy. Um, but I always had the hope and uh, the expectation that at one point I, I free up. And luckily it was not too late when, when I broke him back in the third set. And uh, the belief was always there. But um, from that moment when... When I broke him back for, I think it was three all in the third set, the belief got stronger and stronger. Deep down, he knew the game was there and it was going to come back at some point. Everyone knew watching. That's why I was watching Two Sets of Love. People are talking about a straight sets uh, win for Zverev. And I was thinking, there's no way. There's no way team doesn't fight back and take over some rallies with that forehand and muscle his way back into this match. And of course, he did that and went on to win it. I was this close to saying team in five. Why did I say team in four? I should have said team down two sets to love comes comes back for the first time in 71 years. Goes back to Pancho Gonzalez, 1949. Last time someone was down two sets to love at the U.S. Open final and won the match. Uh, let's move on to the Geary Nathan piece over at Defector.com. Uh, he does a good job explaining why this was uh, raw entertainment tennis. Quote from Geary Nathan. We love when a player barely clears the net cord with a 68-mile-per-hour serve in a deciding tiebreak of a major final and suffers no consequences for it because they were both so nervous, right? Dominic Team was standing all the way back at the wall taking the 60-mile-an-hour serves, and he's too nervous to, to try anything different or try to put the ball away. I mean, it was really something to see. I guess if you haven't played a, a high level of sports or competed with other people for things that are... Uh, you know, big prizes that you value, right? I, I can speak uh, on this from experience because I've played in tournaments around here for more recreational level tennis, but still very competitive where people really want to win. And I've really wanted to win uh, the, they call it the city finals here in Georgia. 
And uh, when you get close to winning or getting to city finals, my, I've never even been to city finals. I've just been very close several times. And I can tell you, every time I was close to getting to city finals, nerves over overcame me that I I couldn't ever imagine before that moment. The only thing I can think of is uh, being really young and being like forced to jump off the really high diving board when you're really scared of jumping off a diving board into the pool. I don't know. If, if you're not scared of heights like me, maybe you never went through that. But you know what I mean? Like imagine real terror. If you can't think of a better example, if you, if you don't play uh, tennis in leagues or something like that, imagine pure terror as a child doing something you want to do, but you're very afraid, you're very uncomfortable, you're very unsure of yourself, you're worried you're going to fail, or you're going to mess up, or everyone's going to laugh at you. You know, think of the most embarrassing moment. Think of, uh, as they always say, the cliches like uh, giving a speech. Imagine, uh, imagine everyone's in their underwear. Imagine you're giving a speech in your underwear. That's probably the only way to imagine uh, how these guys felt out there. But again, uh, 68, 70 mile an hour serves in a fifth set tiebreaker. Uh, Gary Nathan's right. It, it's a spectacle. It's something very interesting to see because it's all mental. It's all in your mind. All right, back to the article. We love to see players unable to sit during a changeover for fear of career altering cramps. Remember, team wouldn't sit down. And Patrick McEnroe added in that moment of the match uh, some brilliant commentary because he's uh, played pro tennis and he's cramped before in matches. And he said, if you sit down, you might completely lose it. If you don't stop moving around, you might completely cramp up and then you're done. Then you like can't even move anymore. Luckily, that didn't happen all the way to Dominic Team. We love to see some of the world's most powerful backhands wilt into geriatric slice. Why does it look like that? Because we're not used to seeing pro tennis players moving like normal humans who aren't incredible, best mover uh, quality in the world. It looks weird if you don't set up and execute a backhand slice with uh, really good footwork when you're in a Grand Slam final. It looks very weird. We love to see one of the sport's grandest pedestals vacated by the three best players ever, partially because of a pandemic, partially because of an accidental assault of a windpipe, and watch as two leaders of the next generation spend whole hours circling that pedestal, face-planting before it, daring the other to ascend to it first. It was mental warfare. I, I mean, this is, you could say this is the greatest match of all time if you like watching the the drama of meltdowns and uh, mental tennis. Somehow, Zverev, he, and he, he goes on to explain something that's very crucial about this match. There was high-level play. It just rarely happened with both players doing it at the same time. The first two sets, we saw uh, the way Sasha Zverev should have been playing all this time, right? It's easy to say. For some, but a lot of people would have felt that way, the way he was attacking the net, the way he was staying so aggressive. Somehow Zverev was dipping his racket down to the hard court for Federer-like half volleys. I remember one in particular where Sasha literally picked it up from behind his heel, his right foot. He picked up a forehand half volley from behind his foot. And I think it was a clean winner. I can't remember, but it was amazing. Touch shots, especially difficult to execute at his height. Mobility, wingspan, and keen timing made for sharp returns to serve. Sasha even broke through the usual aesthetic critique of his game. His joyless, joyless, efficient prosecution of tennis was suddenly enjoyable to watch. Here was a fluid baseliner with al albatross reach, bashing balls from both corners and plucking volleys out of the sky. Zverev leapt to a two-set lead, notched an early break in the third set, and haters of every stripe confessed to me that they were liking the way he played. Count me in there. I've hated on the way Sasha Zverev plays the game in the past. Uh, mainly, I, I, I'm rough on Sasha for how ugly his volleys used to be. They looked very good in this match uh, at, when he was doing them well, when he wasn't freaking out in the end. And uh, the way he was constantly attacking the team slice backhand, that was one thing I kept note of throughout my match notes, was how aggressive was he with that slice to the, uh, to the backhand. He'd step around and hit uh, forehands inside out or inside in up the line, up the backhand, up the line line. And uh, you saw Zverev step in and take them very early. He usually wants to fall back when he shouldn't be playing that defensive. He should be stepping in and using his his full weaponry. We saw him doing that in the first two sets. It was it was outstanding stuff for Sasha Zverev. You really feel for him that he couldn't find a way to win this. All right, last paragraph I picked out from here. When Zverev rolled lifeless serves into play at 81, 76, and even 68 miles per hour, and Dominic Team retreated to the back wall of the stadium as if cowering from the raw might on display. This combination of serve quality and return position was mystifying, possibly unprecedented at the pro level. Not just tactics, but execution went missing for team. Power is the crux of team's game. He played much of this match without it. When he plays passively, he is no threat.
to any top player, which is how Zverev has, has, was able to run up the score on him so fast. Uh, he put that, Gary Nathan put that really well. I mean, that's definitely what happened. As Dominic Team said in the presser, that he, he kind of choked, but in the first two sets, I mean, he, he must have felt a fear that none of us can imagine because I'm telling you, that little glimmer in the, the press conference we heard of the deep inside Dominic Team's heart of hearts we learned that his greatest fear was, as good of a career as he's had, what if he somehow manages to never win a slam? What if he keeps getting close and losing in finals? What if that happened to him? And then how scary is that thought for him? That went through his mind in those first couple of sets. Definitely went through his mind in the end at the fifth set, and somehow he overcame it. Here's the quote of the press, uh, the presser. A lot of good stuff in that presser. I'm playing bad. I'm, this is what teams said about how he felt when he was down two sets and a break. I'm playing bad. I'm too tight. Legs and arms are heavy. I always had the hope and expectation that at one point I'll free up and it won't be too late. The belief was always there. When I broke back, I think 3-3 in the third set, the belief started going way up. Uh, th that's huge right there for Dominic Team. He always had the belief. But hey, instead of listening to his quotes from a press conference from uh, a couple days ago, let's take a listen to the man himself live on the phone right here. We have Dominic Team. Welcome back for a second interview. Welcome back to the show, Dommy. Yeah, testing, testing. Microphone testing. Well, Dominic, I know uh, you're you're trying to get back to get ready on clay for yeah. the open. So I only got a few questions for you today. But my first one is a lot of people were saying you were struggling with an injury early on in the couple sets, and that's why you weren't playing maybe your best. Could you talk a little bit about what was going on physically? Uh, I know we played something from a press conference like this, but tell tell us in, in your own words how that felt. Mats, it's very simple to clear up for you. It's 100% nerves. Everyone knows what the opportunity was for both Sasha and me. And in my town in, in Österreich, we have a little saying that to help you, maybe your viewers understand what I was going through. But it's a mental condition that we call Puppenpanzen. <laughs> That, that's what they call it? Yeah, Mats, Poopenpanzen. I was simply going through one of those, but I'm really glad I was able to find my game, swing freely on the ball, and get my first slam. Awesome. Well, that that's great, Dami. I think a lot of people are happy uh, happy for you, happy that you won. A lot of tennis fans out there really uh, were hoping you would win one of these eventually, and now their wish, your wish as well, has come true. Uh, I want to ask you about Nicholas Masu. He's, been, uh, he's had a major effect on your game. He's been a great coach, a great friend for you, I'm sure. How are you guys going to celebrate? I know it's pretty special for you guys. We could tell when you won the way he reacted in the player box. Do you guys have any special plans for a celebration? Well, you know, Matt, it's something that I'd really struggle with trying to play and uh, celebrate, take a break from tennis. This is really something I struggle with all the time. It's making me crazy living like a normal human if I'm not in an Einflugzeuger or Das Autofusel driving to a tennis court, smashing the ball. If I don't have this in my life, I simply go crazy. And that's the great thing about working with Mr. Masu, my coach, my trainer. He's forcing me to celebrate by changing our travel arrangement back to Europe. We are going in Das Boot. We are going in Das Boot, a little submarine, Se a little really? uh, Utabasa Boot. That, that's <laughs> okay. My trainer, Mr. Masu, he made me travel back to Europe in a little tiny submarine because in a little tiny submarine, there's no room for me to practice my Grundstroken, my serve, my Spittlibittens. There is really no room to practice, so this is the way he can force me to go back without playing tennis and just think about the moment, think about the celebration. I imagine it would be uh, very difficult to uh, to practice tennis in a, 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 you mean like a submarine, right? Yes, Matt, exactly. I'm in Utavasabut, a submarine. Is that a, is that a pretty long journey? Yeah. Well, that's that's awesome. I hope uh, I hope you enjoy the the Unterwasser uh, boat ride back to Europe to get ready for clay. Uh, so, Dami, last question. Uh, Nicholas Masu, your coach, he my told trainer, me, uh, Mr. Yeah, Masu. Mr. Masu, he he told me that you only had a, a little bit of time to do it today. You could do a few questions, so we're gonna keep it literal and do just three questions. Our third and final question is like you're a, it's like you're a magic genie in a bottle, Dominic. Yeah. My third wish from you is to know how you feel about this idea. A lot of people are saying it's somehow a disadvantage for you having gone to the U.S. Open and winning it to now go to the French Open and transition to clay and all that. And it's an advantage for Rafa who skipped it and is going to be more prepared for clay, which I think is kind of bogus because Aren't you much more match tough than Rafa is at this point? Anyways, go go ahead and tell me what you think about that. 
Yeah, Mats, let me tell you something. Now that I'm going back in my little submarine to Europe and I have this uh, US Open Arthur Ashe trophy, for my mental game, this is a big Absolutely, yeah. change. And I really do feel, I don't care if I have to play Novak. I don't care if I have to play Rafa. I am a favorite. I am a Grand Slam champion. And I'm ready to play my game at the French Opens this year. All right, Dami. Well, hey, thank you very much. Good luck at the French Open at Roland Garros when uh, when you go over there. Thanks for doing the show again. And uh, I, I believe you. I think uh, I can tell that you're going to have confidence. In, and I'm yeah, ready to right. play my I'm, game. We'll expect a better fifth set in the final of Roland Garros from you, maybe. All right. Thanks, Dominic. Talk to you next time. Bye. <sighs> wow. What a great guy. What a legend. Uh, anyways, um, final thing on today's show I want to say is He's in the club, asterisk or no asterisk. Mentally, Dominic Team has won a major. And as he said uh, in his presser earlier, said something similar to that in the interview just now. Well, let me get his exact words so I quote him right. But he said in the presser, It doesn't matter at the end who did I beat or which tournament it was. I won a major, and it's amazing. Hit the music, because that is the main idea for me. Would love to see Dominic Team really step things up and win at the French Open. If he does that, no one will talk about asterisk open. They'll talk about how, what a shame Djokovic missed an opportunity to stop Dominic Team before he went on his Grand Slam steamroller. Uh, in Rome, uh, looks like Stan Vavrinka may have gone down. Uh, yeah, I think an Italian teenager just took out Stan Vavrinka. So we will be back tomorrow. Rafa Nadal and Djokovic make their debut on clay for 2020. Uh, so we should be back uh, either tomorrow or the next day with a show catching up on what's going with clay. It's been a lot of fun on the hard courts, but we got to close this chapter and move on to the clay of Europe. Coffee Break Tennis will be there all the way through Rome and the French Open to give you all of the important stuff that you want to know all about. See Everybody can be beat if you're somewhat even with your opponent, even if they're a little bit in the you're struggling with your forehand consistency and power, maybe I'm going to show you five all anecdotes that we're going to be interviewing today. It's still pretty fun to watch Roger do it. Hey, and you get trickier every week. Yeah, so a great time. I'm pitching the other hand, and I say, you actually add more spins, so there's more a lot, high likelihood the ball that can come down in time. Welcome to this very special lesson that's going to teach you how to eliminate, eradicate your number one bad habit.